Okay. Um, so, good day, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, first Falls Lecture Series um, of uh, 2023. And it is our 10th year of doing this series every month. Uh, we started back in February 2013, and Keith uh, presented the very first um, presentation for us. And uh, he has supported uh, the series and uh, health professionals across WA in Falls um, ever, ever since. So thank you very much, uh, Keith. It is appreciated. <laughs> so Keith is the inaugural director of the Rehabilitation, Aging and Independent Living Research Centre at Monash University. Prior to this, he was the head of the School of Physiotherapy and Exercise Science at Curtin University for six and a half years, and also the Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor of the Faculty of Health Sciences at Curtin for one year. He is a physiotherapist, a senior researcher with particular expertise in falls prevention, uh, exercise for older people, aging and rehabilitation. Uh, across his research career, Keith has been a chief investigator on 117 research grants, totaling 36.9 million. And he has 350 peer reviewed publications and has supervised 24 PhD students to uh, completion. Pretty uh, amazing record, Keith. I don't know when you get time to go home and put your feet up. <laughs> So as I've said, the presentation today is going to be recorded and it will be put on the N North Metro YouTube link. If you would like a copy of the slides, please email me and I will send them out to you. Um, Joe, make sure you mute your mic, stay muted and put anything into the chat box until the end and then we can open up the mics and, and uh, ask Keith lots of questions. Today, Keith is presenting challenges and solutions to the COVID related exacerbation of falls, sedentary behaviour and deconditioning in older people. The focus is across the settings, so I think that there will be something for us all. Thank you very much, Keith, and I'll leave you to present. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sue. It's great to be back in Perth, even if it's electronically um, and doing another one of these presentations. Um, when we talked about possible presentation topics. Um, this was a combination of a few things that Sue indicated may be of interest and um, it's not specifically work that I've done a lot of research in, but it, there's quite a bit emerging in the area, which I think is important and relevant for us. So just in terms of um, a little bit of background, I am having a bit of a focus on the fall side of things with respect to this presentation, but it's one of a number of different outcomes. But just to remind you of the magnitude of the problem of falls in, in older people and their interactions from community in and out of hospitals, um, around about uh, one third of older people, people aged over 65 fall each year. So that's a, a very common event um, around about 50% of those who actually get to an emergency department because usually they've had a moderate injury from falls. About 50% of them will have a, a further fall in the next 12 months. Uh, so it's an important place to try to get interventions in place if they're not already in place at the ED. I don't know offhand, but I would then... Um, if, I would put if people have um, been admitted to the hospital ward uh, falls are again a very common event 3.6 percent of admissions in an Australian study across six hospitals um, 3 percent of uh, 3.6 percent of admissions to medical and surgical wards resulted uh, had a fall during their hospitalization and then if we think about the discharge planning that period immediately after discharge home is very critical for older people as well and one study showed that 15 percent of older people fall at least once in that month after discharge and 11% of those are serious enough to warrant going back to the ED and, and, and possibly being admitted. So a very big problem uh, wherever an older person sits uh, across that journey. So thinking about this presentation, the overview really is that we have some pretty common problems among older people, of which falls is one that I've just outlined. 
But other related ones that do impact on falls risk include low levels of physical activity, sedentary behaviour and deconditioning. And so I'll be touching on each of those in this presentation. So older people often have these uh, pre-existing and then throughout the COVID experience of the last few years, there have been added impacts of the COVID uh, pandemic. And these are above and beyond just the obvious infection uh, that can have pretty dire consequences for some people who have uh, contracted COVID, uh, in particular older people and other vulnerable groups. There's also the risk of the potential for long COVID um, for some people. But there's also other impacts of COVID that are not specifically related to the disease, but some of the things that have been put in place to manage COVID and or the ways in which older people have dealt with those restrictions. And I've just termed that here behaviour change, whether or not a person, an older person has had COVID, um, many of them have changed their behaviours and uh, not always in a positive way from an overall health perspective. So I think we've got a fairly mixed audience, so I just wanted to touch on a couple of definitions. And so here, a fall, we need standard definitions of falls because there's very many different definitions, but inadvertently coming to rest on the ground floor or lower level, excluding intentional change in position to rest on furniture wall and other objects is a standard definition from the World Health Organization. Physical activity in terms of the adequate amount of physical activity for older people, uh, people should accumulate at least 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity on most or all days. So that's the 150 minutes a week, which is often talked about. And that's in order to try to maintain your current level of health status. That is what's recommended. Sedentary behaviour is basically anything that doesn't use much energy. And so things like sitting, reclining and lying, and it's associated with physical activity. Obviously, the more physical you are and up on your feet you are, the less sedentary behaviour you have. But in particular, now we're looking also at how long a block of sedentary behaviour ha that, that individuals have. Uh, so it's not just the accumulated over the day, but long periods of sedentary behaviour are also problematic. And deconditioning is just the um, negative impacts of inactivity, bed rest or sedentary lifestyle uh, impacts on muscle and bone uh, function. So just going through a few of those uh, aspects and looking at the prevalence of them in Australia prior to um, COVID, Falls has, has been and is still a major problem in Australia. And despite having an enormous amount of research, much of it happening in Australia in this area, showing that particularly for older people in the community setting that we can do a lot to reduce falls, falls related hospitalisations, and these are age adjusted, so it's not just because we've got more people in the older age groups, but it is per 100,000 people in the older age groups are going up 2, point, uh, 2 to 3% per year. And so those age adjusted figures, if they're increasing, mean that we have an escalating number of case, cases coming to our hospitals and being admitted. This is a really big problem. We can't afford to continue to have what's occurred now over the last 10 years or more, having this increase in rates of force related hospitalizations. The, this data is up to 2021 and it does show a little bit of a dip and I'll touch on that a, a little bit further on uh, that the, the, there did seem to be a bit of a pattern globally uh, of reduced falls uh, in the COVID period. But you can see in the latter part of that uh, COVID period and when things were starting to open up that that we've gone back and we're now at higher levels than we were pre-COVID. So that two to three percent increase is continuing to happen. Now, um, hospitalizations are only 10% or so of the falls that occur. So the vast majority of falls don't cause enough injury to require a person to be admitted to hospital. But even those 90% who don't require hospitalization, a fall can have major impact on an older person, including reduced independence, loss of confidence, reduced quality of life, increased risk of future falls, family and carer burden and 
from a health system and care point of view, substantial increase in costs. So um, on, on all these fronts, falls remains a major issue that we've got to get on top of much better than we have been and that we are now. Looking at physical activity uh, among older people in Australia, um, in terms of that definition I gave you about doing enough to maintain your health, uh, over two thirds of people aged over 65 do not do enough physical activity to maintain their health. So in reality, what will happen over time is that their health will decline, not necessarily due to other health problems, but because they're not being physically active enough. Uh, this is a problem across all ages, as you can see on this slide, but on the right hand side, the 65 plus is where it's particularly prevalent. Now, uh, it's uh, this is a, also a very important issue, not only because of its association with falls, but also because of the total burden of physical inactivity that impacts a whole range of different health problems. And so uh, the Institute of Health and Welfare has estimated that around 20% of the total burden uh, uh, associated with uh, type 2 diabetes is due to being physically inactive. 16% for coronary heart disease, 16% for uterine cancer, 12% for bowel cancer, 12% for dementia, uh, and so on. So not being physically active has a major consequence on general health, both from the point of view of just gradual decline in, in physical performance, but also in terms of likelihood of having a range of other diseases. This slide just talks about the number of risk factors that a person has and um, that an acute health problem of which COVID could be one of those uh, increases the risk of a person. So if a person has five risk factors for falls when they're living comfortably at home, they have a fall, they, uh, uh, so that they contract COVID, they have a UTI, an acute health problem like that, their, their falls risk actually increases. And so what we as health professionals need to do is to understand that that health risk has changed and convey that information to the older person and ensure that our care encompasses that increased level of risk to what they had at home. So it's just important that we recognise that falls risk is not static and that that acute health problem does actually increase an individual's risk of falling while that health problem is present. So I'm going to move from talking about pre-COVID and the impact of these issues uh, to moving into the COVID period and the impact of COVID-19. And I'm going to start off talking about physical activity. So this is an Australian study based in Adelaide. It used mixed methods, so it used some data collection from a quantitative point of view and then did some interviews with older people. And they monitored people at three time points, uh, baseline in the pre-COVID period, under lockdown circumstances and then post lockdown. And just to walk you through a couple of these um, graphs, you can see in terms of sedentary time that it went up during COVID, so the orange bar, and it did not really drop back down to pre-COVID levels uh, after the lockdown finished. So people have be, uh, sustained that higher level of sedentary behaviour uh, post-COVID. Levels of light physical activity have reduced during COVID and then have again been sustained that people haven't got back to the level of light physical activity that they were doing prior to COVID. Looking at trips away from home have obviously reduced during COVID but haven't returned fully back to pre-COVID levels. And of particular note, the, the amount of moderate physical activity that a person does uh, has dropped around 15% and has not returned to uh, pre-COVID levels. So this is showing some indications that older people generally are not uh, resuming what they were doing from a physical activity point of view pre-COVID. 
even though that level of physical activity for many older people pre-COVID was insufficient, it's now more insufficient than it was. That study by Goff in Adelaide also looked at some qualitative findings and uh, they came up with five themes related to uh, some of the findings that they were seeing in that pre, during and post COVID. They, some of the things that they identified as the themes were reframing of meaning. And here they were talking about some of the changes in uh, the meaning or their interpretation of the activities that they were doing, the setup required, the environment and the importance in their lives. And so some things changed, some things stopped, some things in some cases actually changed uh, with new things coming on board. Um, Redefining and, and to maintain activities. Similarly, there were some conscious ad adaptations by some of the older people to continue activities or to find new activities and so on. So overall, this mix of both qualitative and quantitative highlight the need for change and that in some cases that occurred, in many cases, the change was actually detrimental. And the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare has recently uh, published a, a document around insufficient physical activity, and they talk about one year on from the initial in restrictions, fewer Australian adults reported exercising at a gym or playing an organised sport one or more times per week than they did prior to the restrictions. And again, here there was a bit of a rebound after COVID, uh, uh, it went from 38% pre to 25% during COVID and increased to 30% post COVID. So again, these sort of physical activities have not been resumed by older people in Australia. Just to re reiterate that this is not just an Australian problem, this is data from the UK and it shows very clearly uh, over that time period, that massive drop off in the 20 to 21 period um, of participation in physical activity. This was a large UK survey. And a large US survey um, has looked also at this sort of issue in terms of physical activity and also falls risk. And they were look, asking about changes between March 2020 and January 2021. And it's a sample of older people aged 50 to 80. Um, they found that 37% reported reducing their physical activities over that period, 35% had less time on their feet, 37% reported lack of companionship and 46% reported social isolation. So I'm raising those couple of other points here as well as the physical consequences of behaviour change uh, during the COVID period because they also are very important and can also impact on uh, general wellbeing, but also on false risk. And I'll be touching on those a little bit further on in the presentation. Um, but multivariate analyses showed that decreased physical activity, less time on feet and social isolation all increased the, the, the risk of having worse physical function and all in, in, resulted in worse mobility. Uh, and the worst mobility resulted in a greater risk of falling, a 70% increased risk of falling and a worsening of fear of falling. So these different elements of the impacts of COVID and they're really indirect elements of COVID, they're not due to the infection per se, have uh, had moderate impact on the older people that you're going to be seeing in the post COVID period. Um, I might move over this slide very quickly. It really is just the same authors of that previous study that I mentioned there, and they've tried to develop a schematic that highlights the interaction between these various elements uh, associated with the COVID pandemic and then the increased result of risk of falls. Another study in the UK highlighted that 32% uh, of older people who were inactive, um, uh, who did, and this is doing very little amount of physical act activity, so they either did no activity or less than 30 minutes per week. So that's not a lot of physical activity. Um, 
that that actually increased from 27% to 32% over that uh, period. The average duration of strength and balance activity, which we know are very important from a falls risk point of view, decreased from 126 to 77 minutes per week. So again, a, a very important, significant change there. They did also highlight around inequalities and in that, that these differences were more marked in people who were more uh, socially disadvantaged. So an important aspect to keep in mind. But these, these authors in the UK did some projections of what all of that reduced physical activity means in terms of potential increased risk of falls. And this is perhaps not yet seen, but perhaps likely to be seen over the next year or two because of the gradual impact of that reducing physical activity. What they've predicted is that the total number of falls could increase uh, for males by 6% and by fe in females by 4 and 4.4%. 4 so that's a pretty dramatic increase above and beyond what the current uh, situation of falls uh, requ uh, occurring is. Obviously, not all of those uh, cause injuries that require hospitalizations, but as I say, even the non-injurious falls have consequences for an older person. But they have also calculated a cost, an overall cost to the health system in the UK, if that projection is correct, and it's adding an extra 200 million pounds to their health costs. So this is potentially a problem about to hit us uh, if this modelling is correct and if similar patterns are being seen in Australia, which is pretty consistent in what I've seen across the, the different countries in what I've reported to you today. Similar issue with respect to emergency department, uh, seeking emergency department assistance. This is an Australian study that has identified uh, at, uh, at the time of, um, of COVID commencing, there was a pretty much instantaneous and sustained reduction of people seeking emergency department assistance. And so, and in, they did a qualitative and a quantitative element to this. And from the qualitative element, there was a sense among a lot of older people in 32%, they reported that they did not know that they could leave home to seek medical care. And so but people were not necessarily accessing at this early stage of, of COVID, the um, emergency department in a way in which they probably should have been. And again, that has consequences for managing some of the uh, acute and uh, semi-acute health problems that an older person might be developing. In terms of fractures and hospitalisation, this is some data from France, but it shows a pretty clear pattern of reduced fractures occurring in that COVID period and that post-COVID uh, rates have gone back up. Um, and it's anticipated that this is largely due to at-risk older people not having quite as much exposure to risk of falling. In particular, they were going outdoors less, being less physically active uh, outdoors, et cetera, which is often where falls might occur. What has happened to falls in hospitals during COVID, I haven't been able to found, find very much at all on this. Um, I did find one study in Italy uh, that has reported from an acute hospital, 600 beds, that uh, there was a 13% increase in falls in hospitals during the COVID period. So uh, I've just put this slide up because it does highlight what we, what I'm, uh, anticipating we may see uh, as a bit of a rebound from the uh, COVID period is that we may see a new pandemic uh, of falls in older people in coming in the coming year or two. I hope that that's not right, uh, but some of the indicators as per the information that I've shown you today is suggesting that that's likely to be the case. I have mentioned other issues as well as the uh, physical and the um, uh, and the falls related issues this uh, in terms of social isolation and loneliness 
And certainly there's um, uh, evidence, and this is from an Austrian study of 457 retired older people. Um, they identified that more stringent COVID restrictions were asso associated with increased risk of loneliness among older adults, and that was most pronounced in people who lived alone. Clearly, there are differences in Australia, and we in Victoria had substantial greater impact of, uh, of major restrictions. But people were even in WA and, so, and other states with less restrictions were also enforcing to a degree for themselves um, a degree of social isolation and, lonely, and, and, and resulting in loneliness because of not wanting to go out, not wanting to get infected. So one might say, well, uh, shouldn't socialisation actually be better through COVID because there's been quite a bit of report about the use of technology to communicate during COVID and that uh, if people are connecting through phones and mobile apps and whatever, uh, more now, uh, including through telehealth, that, that perhaps they should be less socially isolated. Well, I think there's a number of issues in there, and I can uh, talk from personal experience as well, that digital connection does not equal uh, personal connection, face-to-face -face connection. And many older people have suffered uh, through the COVID period, even though they've had a bit of increase, in many cases, increased um, uh, uh, technology connection. It's not the same. But even among older people, they're not all digitally connected and they're not all digitally savvy. And so um, a report from the OECD reported that only 63% uh, of the, the world's 55 to 74 year olds are now connected globally. Obviously, there's differences between developed and deve developing countries. But compared to young people who are almost universally globally connected, that's a moderate issue. Um, another important aspect of this is around digital literacy, how well older people can actually utilise the digital resources and digital e-health type uh, uh, resources that are available. And this is a study in Australia that looked at um, e-health services in regional Australia. They found 78% of households have access to e-health, but that still means there's a bit of a gap there. Uh, similar to that previous study I mentioned, um, e-health services in, in socioeconomically dis disadvantaged households was lower than in advantaged households. Uh, and a number of factors increase the likelihood of uh, older people accessing e-health services. And some of these were being middle-aged um, versus being older age. Um, household size, and that was usually associated with if you've had a couple of young people in the house, that often helped you to be able to be digitally connected and digitally uh, literate. Having broadband internet access, obviously, which is uh, still a problem in some parts of regional Australia, and digital literacy, that ability to use and interpret the information that you receive. Just a brief slide on long COVID, obviously, because it's another consequence of the COVID pandemic. It's defined as a disease occurring in individuals with a history of probable or confirmed COVID infection and symptoms persisting for at least two months within three months of onset, where the symptoms and effects cannot be explained by another diagnosis. And so um, in one study that was, was looking at long COVID, and it's probably still early days with studies in this space, uh, older individuals with long COVID uh, reported significantly more mobility problems and problems with everyday activities. So these are some of the things that we're seeing for that subgroup of older people who have, uh, through the COVID um, pandemic, who have long COVID. Of course, there are other factors which were not significant in this study, but are important things that are prevalent in some people, some older people with co uh, long COVID. These include ongoing respiratory problems, fatigue, muscle and joint pain, eating difficulties, and mental well-being. And so, we need to be looking for all of these and trying to manage them. So, that's given you a little bit of a whirlwind. Quite a lot of facts and figures thrown at you. Um, in terms of where we're at now, um, I think there's 
accumulated physical and mental health problems among many older people over the past se several years that have accumulated above and beyond their health status pre-COVID and that behaviour changes have also occurred that mean that people are doing less now than they should from uh, and, and from what they were doing pre-COVID in terms of positive health behaviours. And uh, they're also tending to have reduced optimal management of chronic diseases um, through not wanting to and uh, not keeping the regular appointments that they would have other than if the COVID pandemic hadn't been there. So with all of these that uh, added on to people's existing health problems, uh, there will be implications for community services, emergency departments and hospitals. So the people you'll be seeing going forwards will have additional and new uh, problems as a consequence of in, uh, enduring the COVID pandemic. A few things that might help uh, going forwards. I think we have to reinforce getting people back to optimal management of chronic disease. Anyone who has stopped having those sort of appointments and regular reviews and early checks when things are going wrong needs to be encouraged to get back into that pattern. We need to encourage and support appropriate safe increases in physical activity at all interactions, whether it's a patient being discharged home from hospital, in the emergency department, where in the community, this is going to be critical to helping get the, the, at a population level people at a bit better level and reducing that risk of ongoing future falls and other health problems. Anticipate that these people will have a risk of uh, an increased risk of falls and assess and manage that in the community and in hospital settings. Encourage strategies to increase social connectedness. And so that's around strategies to facilitate social engagement at and away from home, but also thinking about improving people's digital literacy Having communication strategies for older people to try and help get the message out about these issues and also looking at uh, uh, developing and implementing booster programs targeting some of these impairments for older people. I think given the time I probably will um, uh, leave the last few slides, which were about a physical activity website that a group of physiotherapists across Australia developed. It's the Safe Exercise at Home website, but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's been a valuable thing to have for people at home to be able to think about what they could do at home. And it's got now information post COVID and so on around getting active uh, in this post COVID period. And so I'll, I'll draw the um, presentation to a close there. Obviously, there have been a number of significant indirect health consequences for older people of this COVID pandemic, uh, which I've gone through in detail in this presentation. These are superimposed on the pre-COVID problems that older people had across these domains. We do know in all of those areas, falls, physical activity, social um, integration and so on, that we can improve these outcomes, but there's limited translation of research into evidence. And so we need better translation and we need additional services and support strategies. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Keith. That was absolutely awesome. I'm just going to stop the recording and then we'll open up for questions.